are super excited to share with you two people that we love dearly, John and Patricia. Uh, they introduced us to the idea of sailing and extended cruising. John's son, Hugh, is uh, who was the catalyst behind my dream and love of sailing. And uh, we spent some time interviewing them. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to share their adventure with you because it's so important, especially important from both aspects because... Uh, as any cruising couple knows, there's two sides to every story, and it's so refreshing um, to hear the realness of theirs. Yeah, we hope you enjoy the interview, and uh, don't forget part two is going to be just as good. John Harris, and um, I got into sailing, uh, kind of a funny story, but I've done lots of uh, interesting things. I, apart from work, I was into rock climbing and mountaineering and river rafting and all these sorts of things. I shattered my femur up at Whistler and skied down an icy pool on it. And, I got back and couldn't do those things anymore, and a patient of mine called and said, John, yes, I've got a boat for you. What the hell do I want with the boat? Well, I don't like my kids, I don't like my wife's kids, so I want you to have it. I'm going to see his boat. It's in the uh, Columbia River on Sobe Island, a little trailer sailor half full of water. And I said, geez, Norm, I don't think you like me either. <laughs> but in any case, he uh, helped me uh, drain the water out and fix it up and taught me the ropes as it were and he told me off the off the uh, mud banks with his little scow and taught me how to bring the boat to the dock and I thought well, this is kind of fun and so I moved the boat up to uh, uh, Cascade Locks in the Columbia River where there's lots of wind every afternoon with the windsurfers and I sailed around amongst the windsurfers and thought this is actually more fun than working <laughs> so but uh, my then wife refused to spend the night on the little boat because it just had a little porta potty and no uh, curtain around it or anything. So we went to the boat show in Seattle and bought a 130, which was used, and that was fun. But in those days, it had uh, it didn't have the GPS; it had Loran, and well, that was okay. It was interesting to find my way around and surprisingly end up where I wanted to be uh, with the Loran. And I thought, well, this is fun too. But I started to kind of think maybe I wanted to go further than I could go in the little 130. And so uh, I started reading all kinds of books about sailing. Of course, the famous ones like Slocum and Boss and the Smeatons. And, uh, and so but I, had, I don't know how I found all the time to read, but I did in those days. <laughs> and so, uh, wow, that sounds really fun. And so when my son Hugh was a senior in high school we had to do a senior project so I said, well, let's do celestial navigation and sail to Hawaii so we both took the class and had a couple of other friends and we sailed to Hawaii and then I had to have people sail the boat back for me because it was the it was the caliber by then we gone to the boat show and bought this boat which we presently still own and um, when I was there to answer your question um, yeah, there was a couple that was just finishing a three-year circumnavigation. And I talked to them and said, wow, that sounds doable. I could maybe stop working for three years and maybe come back. And so I started to read even more and study and learn more things about, you know, what do you do if you're out there and the electronics stop working or what do you do if there's a storm? How do you manage all those things? And it sounded like it'd be kind of fun, so I decided, well, I think I'll just do that. So tell us more about your caliber, Kaolani, uh, make, model, year, and like, why did you pick that, that type of boat? At this point I wanted to be able to sail offshore and I read books about how to choose the best boat and there were all these things they gave about uh, things to look for, uh, sail area to displacement ratio, 
ballast to displacement ratio, ballast to sail area ratio, all those things. I made a list and uh, I had a good friend, Louis, who was a, had been sailing for years and he says, oh, you gotta go to the Seattle Boat Show. There's a boat that you wanna look at, it's called the Caliber. I said, really? And the Caliber, if you don't know, was, they were built in Florida, and it's first I think in the 80s. And these two brothers, um, did a poll of cruisers, offshore cruisers, and made a list of what they thought would be the ideal cruising boat. So that's why they designed the boat the way they did. And the one that I bought was a Caliber 40. It was a 1994 model, but I bought it in 1995. It had been shipped to Seattle and rigged there, and so that's where I found it and, and bought it. The name Keolani is Hawaiian, and I learned later, I looked it up at the Bishop Museum there, um, dictionary of, Keo, of Hawaiian words. Kehau means a misty rain and Lani means heaven, so it's a misty heaven, which is a good name for this part of the world. Yeah. yeah. I left in 2001, so I sailed to Hawaii again, and we got back to Hawaii, and then the next leg was from there to Tahiti, but then from there, a part of my crew just said we've had enough and left, and I was there all by myself. What do I do next? And I was able to get hold of a friend who had sailed before, and it, I, he'd seen the boat once, so he came with his wife and joined me in Bora Bora. <laughs> the idea was to get to New Zealand to get out of the cyclone area for the to see the cyclone season. So we go to the Cook Islands, and we're there and somebody knocked on the boat and said, did you hear about the war going on? No, what war? Oh my God, the U.S. is in war. There's a little hotel and they had a TV for all of us Americans to go look at what's happening. They said, oh my gosh, what do we do now? And so you know, we continued on and went from there to Tonga and then on to New Zealand, but then not just us Americans, but other European boats were all wondering, Nobody now wants to go to the Red Sea like we were all planning. The Suez Canal, with the war going on. And so uh, I ended up circling around like many other boats for five years in the South Pacific, which is not a terrible thing. <laughs> so I mean, my then wife had enough of my sailing. <laughs> so that was, then I'm now looking for a new course to take, trying to figure out which way to go. and. I so said it was a lot more fun not to be alone. There were single-handers who always ended up just hanging out in the bars and drinking all the time. I said, nah, I don't want to do that. Uh, so I ended up happily uh, being able to get in touch with, through sail mail. I don't know if that still exists, but that's how we uh, could communicate by email with my old high school sweetheart, Patricia. Mm. And after several months, convinced her that maybe she was willing to come and just see what it was like to be on a visit on a sailboat for a while. So, uh, <laughs> What did you think about that, Patricia? Yeah. Well, my girlfriend said, you don't know, he may have become the Boston Strangler. <laughs> you haven't seen or heard from him in 35 years. So I said, well, he might. <laughs> but it's highly unlikely. We were emailing like almost every day from April till August. And I think, I think it's possible to learn more about a person and how they've evolved um, when there's a little distance between. Mm -hmm. So when you email someone and there's tough questions, it takes a while to think through what your answers really are. Mm -hmm. and, and we did a lot of that. And you met Hugh. I met Hugh, right. Um, he was working in Washington, D.C. at that, the time. That's my son, who was, right. yeah, And uh, he, I called and said, you know, who I am, a friend of your father's, and, and I'm happy to take you to dinner. And we settled on a place, and he got off the metro, and I picked him up. I thought, it's odd that he's got his computer under his arm, laptop, you know. Um, then I realized that Hugh is into Apple products like all the way, like every new thing. <laughs> so uh, during this course of dinner, he kind of was like a salesman for his father. 
That's why I arranged this and recommended it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had all kinds of photographs of recent uh, adventures. Um, the one thing that, that really put my mind at ease somewhat uh, before I went actually sailing is, um, is Hugh said that his dad planned uh, to cross an ocean or to take a long sail uh, as carefully as he planned surgeries when he was working. You know, a, a plan for all contingencies that might occur in the, after he left shore, before he got to the shore. So that gave him a lot of confidence. He's a pretty smart guy. Reasonably smart. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I really thought that he was competent. He had done across several oceans or bodies of water that I would call an ocean, perhaps not one of the, the five great oceans, whatever. So, I, I don't know, you were here told me that when you met with him for dinner, you said, so your dad oh, yeah. asked me to come visit, but he says on the boat's kind of a Spartan lifestyle. What does that mean? And you said, well, he has a hair dryer. I don't know, Spartan. <laughs> <laughs> That was enough to get you to come visit. Enough. <laughs> I don't know that I ever used the hair dryer. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful boat. Yeah. Well, luckily by then, I had enough time to learn more than I started out knowing. So that by the time she got there, actually, I'd had several months of waiting for her to arrive. So I had planned. She met me in what they call cans, which are cairns. <laughs> On the and eastern I, coast. And somebody had given me a, a program called Sea Maps. I mean, it's like ten thousand dollars if a freighter buys it. But somebody who worked on one of these big boats just gave me the program, and I had a little printer, and he showed me how I could print out the charts for each section, and then even put my course on there and where we'd anchor, from all the way from cans to Darwin, which is a long way across the North Coast. So every night we'd just uh, take off and I'd follow the course, you'd kind of keep an eye out. Sometimes you'd have to anchor out among the reefs and just spend the night there and other times places you can go. Um, so we'd anchor every night and have a nice dinner and he, lots of water. He learned to cook, yeah. he knew. I like to eat, so and, I learned to cook. <laughs> and he had wine to pair with the food he prepared, who knew. Um, and, you know, it was rather pleasant. Every anchorage was beautiful. We didn't get to snorkel because we learned about these things called salt salties. And that salties. was one thing in his invitation. I would get to snorkel on the Great Barrier Reef. And that never happened. I never got my swimsuit wet, actually. Um, Until later. Well, and that was busy. Was busy. Yeah. 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 Um, so he planned all this to tell me this is what the cruising life is all about. Well, yeah. I thought this is not half bad. You know, I could do this. Right. So I convinced you that at our age, you know, uh, we're not getting younger, and if you're interested and willing to go cruising, it's easier to go for different countries if you're married than if you're not. You know, I thought that would be so. Why don't we just go home and get married? You're kidding, aren't you? No. Now, she had told me that in Washington, D.C., she had over the years dated a number of men, but none of them wanted to make any kind of commitment. So I said, okay, now who's shy of commitment here? <laughs> well, <laughs> and then you go back and have an intervention with your lady friends, right? Well, sort of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they all managed to get together the day after I got back. They all tried to explain to me how one month doesn't marriage make. Um, you know, but John's point was very good. We aren't getting any younger. Um, I never expected, I did tell him that I had MS, but it was basically dormant. Um, so eventually I thought about it. 
And I said, well, we can try. So Hugh, by then, has joined me, and we're going to sail on to Durban. And so I believe you told me you were actually in touch with a woman minister in Durban that was going to perform the marriage, you know. But Hugh and I started across the Indian Ocean. We're kind of late getting a start. We're waiting for parts to arrive for a water maker and other things. You know, autopilot was was broken. Remember that. And. Uh, so we get out in what's called the Timor Sea, and there's just no wind. Beautiful, beautiful sunsets there, no wind. Said, We're never going to get across before the storm season. We had now what? So we head back to Australia, and I was in touch with my friend who lived in Adelaide, and he said, well, try Carnarvon and Geraldton. And so uh, we, we, we came back to a place called Broome, what, huge tide differences. You can't imagine how or why, but the tide differences were outrageous and there was no marina. And we signed back in and they said, well, your visa runs out in one month. you got to get out of Australia. You can go to Bali or something and renew it. <laughs> so we headed down the coast and ended up at a little place called Geraldton, which had a cray fishing fleet. And they had their own boat yard on western, north of Perth on Western Australia and a travel lift. So they lifted the boat out and said, yeah, you can leave it here. And Hugh stayed a little longer than I did to meet some friends he'd made when we were in Fiji. <laughs> they lived in Melbourne. And I flew home and I get back to Washington, D.C. I've got, I've been living in the tropics. I've got shorts, flip-flops, a t-shirt. It's cold. It's November. <laughs> so, I went so. to pick him up at National Airport. Yeah. And here's this scarecrow out there with flip-flops on. Everybody else is pretty bundled up. It was a cold snap in November. It was. I told him he had to get there before my birthday. Yeah. And uh, I was turning sixty. That was eighty. Hmm? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so then we had to go see her minister, who was going to marry us, and he says, oh, "I can't do it unless you really have a conference." Was, You're supposed to have three conferences, well, but I told him he said, time. He says, uh, now, tell me this twice. Now, you've both been married twice. You're way older than I am. You have much more experience than I have. What am I supposed to tell you, except that you're both crazy? <laughs> well, I knew the pastor pretty well. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of like my girlfriend's inter intervention. Um, you know, he thought it was a snap decision on my part, and I never make snap decisions. And maybe it was. Oh, anyway, so we did get married, and he was my best man. And I told uh, Matt earlier he gave a toast at, our, at her house, this big party, all her friends. I had a few friends that actually were there. Yeah. Uh, Danny and Susie and Lon, but um, he would say he's got to give a toast. Well, what am I going to say? He asked, Hey, and my and sister. Says, yeah, that'll be all right. So, click, click, everybody's top. Toast to, to the couple says, uh, May my Patricia learn to tolerate my dad's quirky sense of humor, and may my dad learn to bite his tongue, neither of which has happened. <laughs> <laughs> so then, right. Hugh and I went back to get the boat ready to sail again, and that's when Matt joined us in Geraldton. And Patricia, yeah. and we took off from there on and, the fourth of July, yeah, in two thousand and seven. Yeah, and the first leg is across about fifteen hundred miles to Cocos Keeling, a little atoll in the Indian Ocean. And the first night out, Patricia says, "So, honey, uh, where do we stop and anchor for dinner?" And I said, "I'm sorry, I don't have two miles of chain. We have to keep sailing." She said, "What? We're going to just keep sailing?" Yeah. You didn't tell me about this. Yeah, you know, what, did you think I'm stupid or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I had never been on a, on a small sailboat. I mean, this isn't, for a sailboat, this is big, it's 41 feet. But in the ocean, I discovered the waves are huge. It's like a little matchbox going up and over. And I always kept thinking, that wave behind us is going to crash down on us. 
But for the most part, the little boat went up and over and up and over. It's, uh, it was amazing. <laughs> so we kept sailing and we got to Cocos Keeley and we went in and anchored and uh, this is a very interesting place. I won't tell all the story of it, but there's a place called uh, Direction Iowa and they used to have a, uh, a radio underwater cable that came there like in World War I you know, for cable messages and now nobody lives on that island but they have a little hut with people put their memorabilia from their sailboat. I was here and everything. And then there's a pass between the islands and you can swim out really hard and then float through the pass and see all kinds of fish and then swim back to the shore. And so Hugh takes one arm and I take the other one so we can paddle out there and get out in the current. And then we're floating along and I say, there's sharks down there. So I tell her to look over that way. She says, what, there's nothing there. Just keep looking that way. <laughs> I have a rule, I don't swim with sharks. It's, it's just testing fate too much. <laughs> anyway, she had already planned to fly home and go back to Virginia for her niece's wedding. And uh, Hugh and Matt and I said, okay, let's go across the Indian Ocean, what the heck. <laughs> so, of course, the uh, autopilot stopped working about halfway. So we a thousand miles had to hand steer. And luckily, Matt enjoyed that. We were happy for him to enjoy it. And then we got to Mauritius, and Patricia joined us there. And then we spent some time there and in uh, Reunion, and then we went out. I told Patricia, I don't want you to do the next leg, because I've read so much about the, the British Admiralty chart says it was some of the biggest waves in the world off the east coast of South Africa, because the, a gullus current comes down and the winds off the Southern Ocean, when they're blowing it, wind against waves, it's huge waves. And I figured, well, if she's in something like that, uh, she'd probably be done with the sailing. So <laughs> go somewhere and meet us in Durban or Richard Bay, okay. So she goes to uh, Florence, Italy, because she has a girlfriend taking art lessons there. And so Matt and Hugh and I are out there sailing. We go past Madagascar and we're in the current. And now there's a radio guy named Fred Meyer, no relation to the one with the grocery changer, but he's an old sailor and pilot and he maintains a radio contact for the yachts that are coming either down uh, the, from, the, oh I'm sorry, the names of the other island, but anyway, the, the, on either side of Madagascar, are either coming down the channel or coming across like we were. And he says, okay, he gives you the weather report and he says, um, okay, how fast is your boat? There's a weather uh, storm coming. If you can get to the 100 fathom line before it gets here, you'll be okay. Otherwise, head back to sea. So, okay. And then all of a sudden, those of you who know about these things, the, the radio waves go up to the ionosphere and come back. And it's short way. Yeah. When you get into this, uh, into the shadow where you can't get messages anymore, and you can't talk anymore. So we're almost, we're just in the current and I can't get hold of Fred Meyer anymore. But I had a thing called Inmarsat. I could send a, like a telegram message by satellite to Patricia in, uh, in Florence. I said, honey, please look up the weather report for South Africa and tell me what you see. And she says, it's really pretty. They got these wavy lines and they're really close together. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> He loves to tell that story, that's not, not precisely how it went. <laughs> anyway, we, came, we got, made it across uh, uh, without any big problems and, and then she came and joined us in Durban. And then... Um, Durban, South Africa. Yeah, and I thought, okay, now the next leg, you go around the Cape of Good Hope, which uh, some people, the Europeans used to call the Cape of Storms. Uh, until Cape Horn was discovered. <laughs> and so what you do, it turns out they have a very good weather report system and the, the boys got us a system where we could uh, receive the messages from the shore on the boat while we're underway. And what you do is you coast hop from place to place and they said there are two days a week when the weather is good enough for recreational boats to go from one place to another. The freighters do what they gotta do. But um, So we if the weather's good, you continue on to the next place. If not, you stop and wait. So we were coast hopping down the coast. We got around the Cape and 
Uh, well, by then our head stayed broken, so I said, no, we have to stop sailing and just motor around to get to Durban and replace this standing rigging. So we motored around the Cape, which wasn't what I wanted to do, but it was okay. And uh, then we get to Cape Town for, in time for Christmas. And we spent several months in a wonderful time in Cape Town.